Hello, once again, we are very much delighted. Hopefully, a member of Knesset Lapid has arrived. When I was asked to introduce member of Knesset Yair Lapid at the Hatzaliyah conference, I was happy. It took me right back to my youth when we used to go to school together in high school in Jerusalem. And I don't have to say how, many long, how long ago it was because I'm a woman, but I can reveal that he liked school then, much like he likes Knesset discussions today. Member of Knesset Lapid is the founder of Yesh Atid Party. He was the Minister of Finance in the 33rd Israeli government, and he was then the member of the, of the cabinet and also the head of the um, Intelligence Committee. He was born in 1963 to Shulamit Lapid, the authoress, and Tommy Lapid, of blessed memory. He was the head of the Israeli Broadcasting Authority. He was the Deputy Prime Minister and also Minister of Justice. And with such parents, he could not but be an author or journalist or publicist, and that he was until 2012 when he announced that he was becoming a politician and founded the Yesh Atid Party. This party is trying to go against this uh, dichotomy of right and left and to create a political center with an agenda of priorities for Israel, for Israel placing the middle class in the center and have, reaching a peace agreement that is based on a two-state solution. In 2013, they surprised in the elections, becoming the second largest party with 19 mandates. Just months later, he was named by Times Magazine as one of, some, one of the leading people, most influential Jews in the world, also by the Jewish Jerusalem Post. And he is, in fact, the focus of our nation. And it's very hard to find a more colorful member of Knesset. He is a broadcaster, journalist. He writes plays. He was an actor. And he is also a um, boxer. And that's not even the longest list. He has published 11 books, which he authored. And the most prominent is Memories Following My Death, which he wrote about his father and was on the bestsellers list 100 times. Everyone knows him from television and every home he is known. And for many years, he wrote a weekly column in the Otacharnot newspaper until he went to politics. And it makes him one of the most appreciated people in politics. In the 2015 elections, Yesh Atid only got 11 mandates and became the fourth largest party in the current Knesset from the opposition benches. Member of Knesset Lapid is part of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee as, as well as the intelligence one. He is also in the subcommittee of public diplomacy and he continues to perform in public diplomacy, combating BDS and fighting for Israel's image in the world. Since he began his road in politics, he has not left anything left anything standing. He has turned every stone in order to fight corruption, to bring about the enlistment of the ultra-Orthodox in the army, to ent have them enter the labor market as well as the Arabs, and also to make changes in government agencies. When he w was fired by Benjamin Netanyahu last year, he did, but, his, but his, the polls still see Lapid as the only alternative for Israel's prime minister uh, versus uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So, Mr. Knesset Lapid, the floor is yours. Good morning. I entered politics five and a half years ago. And in five and a half years, I have seen members of Knesset who stand at the plenary and mocks a wonderful member of Knesset who's sitting in her wheelchair for being handicapped. I saw the prime minister insulting journalists, lefty, leftists, Arabs, attacking his own minister of defense, attacking the IDF. I saw a chairman of a left wing party uh, blaming people for sexual assault without having any proof, and I saw a candidate for the Labour Party 
really insulting and saying racist comments about someone and even smiling afterwards because they thought it was funny. I saw bills passed that have no significance aside from insulting another religion or another race. More and more ministers are under police interrogation. The person who was convicted of stealing in, while he was minister is once again being uh, suspicious of one of the same actions. And people look like they have all the time in the world. This state is under a cloud. Just say that he didn't do anything or just say that there's an indictment, but just finish with it already. Those nearest or closest to the prime minister have received millions for the deal over the um, submarines, and we've just gotten used to it. Corruption has just become part of life. Uh, in these five and a half years in politics, I have met more convicted felons than I have met my entire life before then. So it's true that those who were su suspected of, uh, of um, corruption have always been there, but now they don't seem to care. They threaten the freedom of expression, and the prime minister is reacting to a legitimate journalist work violently against a very important journalist. And he's allowed to respond to her, to her inquiries, and to her broadcasts, but just why is it so evil? You're not a talkback person. You don't just write on Facebook. Respect yourself. Anyone who goes into, who inquires into the Prime Minister is ultimately a traitor, can, must be stopped in any way. And I, I'm not saying I'm holy. I have made mistakes, but these such mistakes? There's no reason for things to be this way. Or perhaps there is a reason. There's a reason why our politicians, our people who say that they lead the, sta the state of Israel, but they are behaving this way because it pays off, because they don't pay any price for it. Not politically, nor publicly. The media actually rewards them. The more the insult, the bigger the headline. Politicians know that if you're, they're willing to insult others, they will get time on television. They will get a headline. The t attention is the currency of politics. If you want to be exposed, that's the way. Just completely attack someone, insult someone, insult anyone who thinks other than you do, who has a different opinion, insult religions. It works very well when you insult other religions. There is no media or political existence above the belt, only below the belt. And who does that represent? The Likud? Begin was not anything like that. David Levy wasn't anything like that. Those who vote for Likud are not like that. And who does that represent? This contest of insults called the Labour primaries. Does it, does it uh, represent Ben Gurion? No, he would have thrown out all nine of them. The, most, the loudest of ministers is also the most popular of ministers, dragging the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defence, to political mud. She gets credit for it. One of, her, the, one of the members of the Knesset said that, he sh that the Supreme Court should be demolished. All of these people, of course, have been condemned. Everyone always condemns them. If you don't condemn them, you'll be condemned for not condemning. But condemnation is part of the game. If someone isn't condemned, I guess they didn't say anything. Even legislation has become part of the insult machine. Two, over the last two years, more and more bills have been presented that have no content, nothing practical. Their only purpose is to create conflict and therefore create headlines. And that's not a, uh, a bottom-up process. The people is not like that. The people is against racist racism and their people and their children volunteer in order to help people with disabilities. It comes top-down from the top the biggest top. It comes from the Prime Minister. Because democracy is boring to these politicians. Democracy seems like a, a wussy's game. And after your elections, there have been so many articles in the paper about what the Prime Minister said, how the Arabs are going on buses to the elections to vote. And it, it is, how is it that a Prime Minister goes against 
the fact that citizens are going to vote and because they're Arabs and it was just a lie. There were no buses and there were no many Arabs going. But there was one thing that they forgot to say. He won the elections. Apparently, it was a winning thing to do. If you lie and insult and break apart Israeli society, you end up victorious. So don't let anyone sell you the fact that it's always been this way. I didn't come to politics from Mars. For 30 years I was in the media and it was never this way. There were always conflicts, disagreements, but there were always, always basic principles that everyone adhered to. Basic respect for one another, basic respect for yourself that required people to at least pretend that the laws of human conduct applies, apply to them. Everyone makes mistakes every so often. Everyone gets angry every so often. Mistakes happen. I, didn't sh I shouldn't have said to Arya Derry that he needs to be rehabilitated. Not because there's a problem with the principle, but because he shouldn't insult people uh, live on television. So I made a mistake and I apologized. But what's been happening over the last two years or three years is no mistake. It's a system. It's a method. It's an accelerated, intentional process of destruction. It's an intentional process of draw making gaps, of dividing the population, and it has political logic behind it. And their political logic says that as the more Israeli society is divided and tribal, then the election patterns and voting patterns will also be tribal. People stop voting because they're asking themselves what's best for them or what kind of country they want for their children. Instead, they vote for their tribe. They don't vote for those who speak to their hearts and minds, but for those who make their blood boil. They don't vote because they're wondering who they are, or they, or they vote because they're against someone. And the, those who gain most from this division of the us and them are actually stopping the existence of a single unified Israel working towards the greater good. We have gotten to the situation where we don't remember anymore because most of these things, most of the things we agree on, and it's okay for us to get angry. And we should be angry about those who try to divide us. We need to be angry at, at those who are trying to turn us against one another. This is our dream. This country is our dream, and it shouldn't look like this or sound like this. What exactly do we want our children to learn? How to hate one another? Or how to live together with one another? Over the last few months, myself and my team have contended with an a problem that was unpredictable. We kept, people kept arguing that we're not saying anything and we wondered how is this happening because there's no single issue in Israeli society that we didn't express our opinion about. I have expressed my opinion about all the painful burning issues from the Elora Azaria affair and the electricity outage in uh, Gaza and the submarines, but I've said nothing crazy, nothing extreme. So as far as they're concerned, I've said nothing. I'm going to tell you that's not going to change. We will continue to express our opinion moderately in a balanced way, recognizing that reality is complex. They keep telling us, what are you today, left or right? How dare you not be catalogued, not be boxed, not be branded. Well, we're not left or right. We're center. We think that reality is not one-dimensional. We are Zionists. We love Israel. We'll do everything in our power to make it strong and successful. And from here on, from here on, everything is open to discussion. Sometimes the right wing is right. Sometimes the left wing is right. Sometimes justice is somewhere in between. Anyone who's trying to bend reality so that it can go along with their politics is weakening our country. They're asking me, why aren't you talking? I'm talking. I'm just not insulting and I'm not yelling. So under these new rules of the game, it sounds like I'm not saying anything. I don't care about being part of this parade of people who since 6 a.m. get on the radio and start insulting people. That's not the reason why I and my friends have come to politics. What we care about is what's good for this country. We're saying something. We're just not yelling it. If anyone wants to know what we're saying, they will have to listen. 
My dear friend Micha Goodman says that the biggest failure of Israeli society is that we have come to a situation where we identify extremism with authenticity. But extremism is not authenticity. There's nothing less authentic than extremists because they're disconnected from reality, because they don't care what's really happening. They come with their extreme ideology from home and nothing will change it. The problem is that extremism these days is not in the margins. It's in the government. It's part and parcel of the government. It is the language that this government is speaking. A very small portion of ministers and members of Knesset are saying what they say because they are extremists. But the others are even worse because they're not real extremists. They're cynicists. They don't care what damage they are causing to Israel or to Israeli society as long as it's good for the primaries and elections. They have adopted and embraced this kind of discourse because it exempts them from doing their work. Cynicists have done nothing, have built nothing, but they have demolished quite a lot. And you know why this coalition is so violent toward the opposition? Because they have reached the conclusion that they will be in regime for no, for, oh, forever. That as long as this method of tribes works, they will forever and ever be the rulers. And the political game works as follows. If you are the ruler, you are kind and generous towards the opposition because maybe tomorrow you'll be in the opposition and they'll be the rulers. But this current government doesn't believe that. They have reached the conclusion, they have cracked the system, and if anything were to ever threaten their regime and their election, they will talk about tribes, about violence, about racism, about hatred and fear, and they'll win again. They have come to the conclusion that the voters are eight-year-olds who just want to go and fight one another and beat one another up. So they'll talk to them as if they're eight-year-olds who want to beat each other up, and then they'll win the elections. And the moment that's how they think, they have no reason in the world to respect the others. They have... They are completely unrestrained. There are no more limitations, not the Supreme Court, not democracy, not basic generosity and kindness between people who have different opinions. There is just one thing that can stop it. There's only one thing that can make this trend turn and reverse itself, and it's called the citizens of Israel. And I would like to call upon them from this podium to overtake politics, to overtake the media. Let's prove to them that we are adults. We're not eight-year-olds who want to beat each other up. We are adults, and adults understand that all of us must live here together. Adults who remember that we all want the same things, a strong, prosperous state of Israel whose citizens are good to one another. I think that when you live together, you need compromises, attention, paying attention to each other. We have to say to the government, stop being frightened that there will be more than one voice. We're looking for real solutions to real problems. They need it for like a breath of fresh air. The only reason that they will continue voting for those same people and the same parties, it's not because they're stupid. It's because they weren't offered a real other alternative, another path. The Likud said, we are them. So the Machanet Zioni said, they are us. What's the difference? In order to find solutions, we don't need to find enemies, but rather partners. Partners from all the camps who will build together a work program and plan for the next few years. And it is in the favor, for the, the benefit of the government to behave in that way because they haven't got such a work plan. Yes, they've got a wondrous way, enviable, to actually sort of the steal the kudos about things that they were created as if by them, like the IDF or the high-tech startup nation. But anything that it is really their role to do, they have no plan whatsoever. Kudos, yes, they want to say it's theirs. Do you know what their plan is to close the social gaps? What is their program that in the next 20 years, a third of the employees are going to lose 
their um, jobs because of machines that can think and uh, robots? What is their program for the Gaza Strip? They haven't got one. The Prime Minister hasn't got a program and he won't have one. I respect the Prime Minister sometimes more than he even respects himself. And I do, I'm not part of that dialogue that blames him for anything and casts the Persians against him. But there is some kind of exhaustion. What you haven't done in four terms of office, you're not going to manage to do. So all this horrific discourse, this entire, this, these aspersions and this, the whole kind of sort of flouting that's going on, it's all in order to hide the fact that they have no program. We have a plan. If anyone says to me, what have you got? Well, we haven't got 15 years ahead of us of insulting people, but we do have a seven-point plan. Security, separation from the Palestinians, enforcing of the law, religion, and the state, and trying to accelerate um, science and technology, education, etc. We've been working on it, teams working with bill proposals, budgets, the lot for the last two years. We know how to bring into Haredi men and uh, Arab women into the labor force, and how to improve the enforcement of law in Israel, talking about not only the PR of this um, whole nation and improving other fears and spheres and mechanisms to work with the Bedouins and we talk about the settler areas and all those who have been totally neglected like the periphery and the disabled people. Have you got any caveats? Have you got any ideas? More constructive ones? Jolly good. That's the idea in a dialogue. Let's dialogue about it. That's what a real center does. They listen to everyone and then they go and carry it out. We're not a sort of middle point between left left and right, between all the various uh, voices of Israeli society. They are the right interweaving of them all. The, the, the center is not a place, it is action. And so, yes, we have a plan. But the, the first sine qua non of that plan is that we should stop saying things against each other, flouting each other. If we want something good to happen, we need to relearn how to work together, united, one people, one people of Israel, one Israel people. That is our path. Thank you very much.